We left Rosa for the final time in the state of Chiapas and took a 30-hour bus ride across by land to Quintana Roo, Mexico. We met up with Robbie's mom and stepdad and started our visit there by sailing a bit on a friend's boat. We couldn't quite believe this place that we had come to. This part of the Mayan Riviera consists of an almost continuous strip of resorts and gated communities along the ocean. South along the highway brings you to the famous Mayan ruins of Tulum, and northbound brings you to Cancun, an international airport, and to Isla Mujeres. We were staying aboard Tony and Celine's 60-foot steel bohemian schooner, a massive world sailing boat named Vintas, which they had somehow managed to squeeze into the tiny canals of Puerto Aventuras. We weren't planning on staying long. We were trying desperately to find some affordable flights to the other side of the planet, to the boat that was offered to us. But getting to the other side of the globe and taking on a project boat that was in fact kind of similar to Vintas was turning out to be a logistical nightmare. Vintas is a lot of boat with a lot of work. We could fly there and then be stuck in a very isolated part of the world without any money with a boat that needs lots of work. So instead we enjoyed the company of the animals at Tony and Celine's workshop. This little dog from the street started to grow on us. And Lupita, who already owns the place, wasn't liking him too much. We were incredibly lucky to be invited on a trip with Robbie's parents to the town of Valladolid, just inland of us. Deep in the jungle of the Yucatan Peninsula, there is an unfathomable place shrouded in limestone and trees. We traveled down a path, wound through the tunnels, deeper down into the earth, until arriving at a spot that I never imagined existed. Whoa! The color! When I was first told that we would visit a cenote in Mexico, I think I imagined a cave. I've been in the narrow passages and confined spaces of a typical cave before. I was not prepared for this cenote. As rainwater eats its way through the geological features of this area, hidden cave systems slowly form over millennia underground in the limestone, eventually caving inwards, or in the case of this younger cenote, simply having small punctured holes of light. Swimming in a cenote's water is an ethereal or otherworldly experience. like floating halfway up the ceiling of an exquisitely decorated cathedral. As the sun moved and the clouds traversed the sky outside, the light inside the chamber changed minute by minute. The roots of the trees above reaching down into the fresh water, catfish slurping around, and stalactites growing in slow motion. Ancient Mayans may have not liked people swimming in these limestone pools. Cenotes have long been a life-giving source of clean fresh water in the region. Because many of the thousands of these cenotes are interconnected by a labyrinth of cave systems, it's ecologically important to keep them pristine. Although it felt like a cleansing of the inner self, we made sure to be free of substances like sunscreen on the outside before getting in. This particular property has two cenotes, and we now headed to the collapsed roof one. This site has been under construction for visitor development over the span of more than 10 years giving it the feeling of an abandoned theme park or lost city in the jungle. Unfinished structures are being overgrown with vines and webs, as well as empty fountains housing little tadpoles. And then we arrived at the pool, an inverted version of the last cenote. Here, the roof was a green canopy. Even though the rock ceiling had collapsed, the bottom seemed much further away, impenetrable to the light. With the same catfish residing here, I wondered what kind of hidden tuttles and crevices they traveled through to populate both pools. (laughs) 
<laughs> we didn't bring any serious diving equipment with us and wondered if there are any significant passages to explore adjacent to the main chambers. Anyways, without getting too deep into all of this, it was an amazing day in the Agua Dulce, which makes you feel much heavier than salt water, by the way, so we were pretty drained by the end of it. A quick flight directly overhead revealed the ambitious resort being built around the otherwise invisible cenote. We made our way through clay and rock mazes to the resort rooms encircling the water below. With such amazing natural settings around this peninsula, it's easy to see how so many tourists pour into this side of Mexico each year. I noticed a tarantula jumping out from her burrow and discovered that playing a tug of war with such a spider is kind of like playing with a cat. She was surprisingly strong. I mentioned before that Tony and Celine have a sail loft here along the coast, but a popular request that they get at the shop these days are the glamping tents for eco-resorts. This one took a couple of hours to assemble on site, and because Tony's designs incorporate the surrounding flora, they are sought after by proprietors who don't want to deal with the complications of constructing permanent structures. Meanwhile, it was looking like our next ship to sailboat possession had sailed. We saw a local online ad for a possibly free sailboat up at Isla Mujeres, though. We jumped on the opportunity to at least go check it out. This wasn't your typical sailboat. We watched the high-speed ferries make their way back and forth from the island, but later learned that the slower car ferry costs five times less than the one we were taking. Isla Mujeres was looking like a great place to walk around and explore. However, we had barely set foot on the sand when a guy named Chris flew in with his prow and gave us a cruise around the bay. Now Chris had put up his sailboat and his prow for sale some time ago, but at this point he hadn't found anyone serious enough to come and see him in person. He built this Esperado with his own two hands and wanted to find a good home for the little Pacific flying prow even if it meant giving it away for free. We came along and we just knew that this awesome little multi-hull would be great for fishing and zooming around and maybe even taking longer trips around the Caribbean with. So what's gonna happen with the, the rudder now that we switch sides, it just, just drags, right? Chris didn't even seem to flinch at this thought. After all, he'd sailed the tiny craft from the Gulf of Mexico down to Panama and back. It was starting to look like this was going to be our new boat. Oh wow, look at her go. I know. You seem quite worried about speed and all this, but I'm impressed. It's a race. The race is on. but it was going to be a huge decision for the builder of this Esperado. To give away the craft that he'd built, he would have to think about it. Sure. Run them over. Yeah, exactly. Get a bit of blood in the water. 